Well, first of all, our thanks to the organizers for the invitation and for making time available to us. And thank you for your attention. After all, it's uh, not going to be an easy subject, and we're going to be on for one and a half hours. Now, uh, there's two of us speaking, and that might uh, be a bit confusing. But if we talk about physics and uh, the life sciences, well, that makes sense to have uh, the experts in place, and uh, we propose to do just that. And I think it might also be more interesting if the two of us take uh, turns. We're not going to sing. Don't don't worry, it's not a duet, it's just a two speaking, and we'll let one another finish. <laughs> now, uh, the motto of natural sciences has been expressed by Goethe in uh, Goethe. He said, or Faust said, um, that uh, I may recognize what holds together the world in its inmost folds. That is often uh, used uh, by uh, natural scientists to describe the world. But uh, Goethe himself uh, wrote to uh, Paul Caesar von Leonhardt uh, that I do not want an atomistic atom in myself. Yeah, he wouldn't tolerate that, he said. Yeah, not an atom, atomistic atom in himself. He was looking to magic uh, for a solution. Well, we, in fact, uh, try to use sciences to find answers to those problems. Uh, new things as opposed uh, to old things. Well, if you want to change the world uh, view, then you will come up against objections and rejections. That's not only something that you will find in art, but also in sciences. It is quite challenging and not trivial. And uh, even in medicine, people have been trying to find new ways. And of course, people often enough succeed. There's uh, one person uh, who tried uh, just that. That is Fritz Albert Popp. And his research tried to open up new ways. And he did succeed. <laughs> yeah, I think it's worth a warm applause. Thank you. Let there be light. Um, that is the beginning of the Old Testament. And here we see, that is by uh, Michelangelo in the Sixtine uh, Chapel, how uh, God Father bans uh, South, uh, sun and moon and makes them uh, mere lamps against uh, the sky. And uh, then there's a picture by astrophysicists. This is how the first light came about, the first light as it enters the universe. And I think this is a very precise picture with uh, micro Kelvins of uh, temperature difference between the blue and the yellowish structures that you can perceive. Oh, uh, just a brief remark, what you see here is what remains of the flash uh, that remained of the Big Bang after the universe had become transparent. And uh, this is uh, 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And uh, this light, in the course of uh, the 3.7 billion years, has cooled down so that the temperature is only uh, 2.7 degrees above the absolute zero point. And the difference is between uh, yellow and blue, that's a thousandth of degrees. And that is a highly uh, precise measurement. And uh, this is probably the starting point of uh, all that was to follow later in cosmos. As we talk about uh, light, we first of all need to define what we mean by light, we physicists. And light is the abbreviation for all the electromagnetic spectrum, which reaches from the longest waves. And uh, that is uh, what drives your radio clocks. Uh, there are radio waves, microwaves that you have in uh, your kitchen, the heat waves of infrared, then uh, the only octave that we can see with our own eyes. And uh, then there's ultraviolet light and uh, X-rays and gamma rays. And uh, it's one and the same manifestation, however, with increased frequencies and uh, with longer wavelengths. As we go into the other direction, energy of uh, the rays keeps increasing. And this is what we mean if we talk about light in physics.
physics. So it's not just uh, the visible spectrum that we can see with our own eyes. Now, what, however, holds the world together? And the physicists tell us it's four forces that can be described that we have in our inmost folds. And uh, what all non-physicists know is gravity. And you felt the effects yourselves if something dropped on your head. And also, uh, we stand uh, rooted uh, on Earth. We have both feet on the ground for the reason of gravity. You cannot see the force itself. You can only see the effect. And Newton met with a lot of resistance because he created and calculated a force which was not visible until then. People had been thinking of ro um, ropes or rods that kept things together. And our sun is uh, held by this force and the elliptical pathways of the planets of uh, is all, are also controlled by gravity. Uh, well, this is uh, something I'd like to, uh, to talk about now uh, because I feel uh, this is something we've forgotten. Uh, force was always pressure or um, that was pushing or shoving. Um, well, you can either push a cart uh, or you can pull it or have a horse do that. But a force that reaches from the Earth to the Moon without a rope in between or anything else, well, they complained to Newton that he was inventing uh, something like magic. Uh, he was postulating things, they said, that was not visible at all. And at the time, uh, that was a major point of criticism. How, uh, these days, it's very difficult to understand, even though we feel we meet up with a similar rejection. So matters uh, or things that keep uh, things together, that is the nuclear force. The nuclear force uh, makes sure that the nuclear cores, uh, nuclei, hold together, however, uh, if um, you put a stress or strain on that force, you might uh, get uh, into a situation that you'd rather not have. So nuclear power or nuclear force is uh, also something that is used in nuclear power plants, used for power generation, and you can see some of the consequences here. Then there is a weak force. The weak force is um, what uh, lets the radioactive uh, fallout uh, light up or shine, but it is also used in medicine. And you know these colorful images of the brain where uh, weakly radioactive dextrose is injected, and that dextrose goes to the areas of the brain where a lot of energy is being used. And this is can be, what can be seen from the outside. This is an image of a PET. Most important for everyday life, though, uh, because it is present all and everywhere, is the electromagnetic force. It is uh, the force uh, which uh, shows light as a, its effect. All that happens in our natural environment is determined by electromagnetic interaction. So everything that is not gravity, everything that you perceive is always uh, the outflow of uh, the electromagnetic force. Uh, and uh, the outflow of light, if you want. Max Planck began with quantum physics. And uh, that was at the time when people were trying uh, to determine the interaction between light and matter. So heat radiation was studied by him, and he uh, said that uh, light was not simply a wave, as you still hear in the 101 on physics. But um, if you study things very carefully, and if you measure, then you will see that light comes in uh, light portions, which are very small. The energy of a fr frequency or a radiation of a certain frequency uh, will arrive in portions of uh, aged by new. And Einstein, as we heard, uh, got his Nobel Prize for saying that if we really wanted to understand light, uh, then we need to understand light as uh, light quantum. Photons uh, was not his terminology that was invented later, but it goes to show that uh, Einstein already prepared the ground, and the Nobel Prize committee uh, was justified in awarding the Nobel Prize to him for this. Now, forces in physics 
Exile Today defined as an exchange of virtual photons uh, to electrically charged bodies um, acting one on, on one another. This is something that uh, you cannot see. You feel it, but you can uh, not see it. But if you accelerate a charge, then these virtual photons can become real, and then they will radiate. So accelerated charges can uh, radiate, then real photons get emitted. As long as the acceleration is not visible, the photons are virtual. That is, they, they exist in possibility as possibilities. Light as an active force controls almost everything, as I said before. Uh, there's something that we are not usually aware of. As we see, of course, everybody will see a yes, seeing. Uh, that has definitely something to do with light. But everything else also has to see to do with light. That is uh, smelling, uh, tasting, hearing. Uh, that has to do with the exchange of uh, virtual uh, photons. And what people are not aware of either is that chemistry and biology are also based on the exchange of real and virtual photons. This is why you can claim that electromagnetism is the interaction which is fundamental to life. You need to bear that in the back of your mind uh, as uh, you think about Fritz Albert Popp's work. Um, the nucleus, the atomic core, is uh, often still shown uh, with Bohr uh, orbits around it. After you've seen that for a while, uh, you'll find it difficult to understand how quantum physics work because uh, the Bohr model is uh, just the opposite of quantum physics. What you see in quantum physics is that there are no orbits of uh, uh, electrons. Yeah, if you measure, you might actually find an uh, electron somewhere, but there's a core, a nucleus, and there are possible places where electrons might appear, and what quantum physics can calculate is the probability at which place you might be able to find electrons and how often or how rarely you are likely to find them. The quantum resolution revolution, Professor Ewald uh, spelled it out already, it dates back to 100 years ago. And uh, there's a revolution because the world view, which used to be mechanistic, deterministic, materialistic, well, that uh, picture, that world view was completely overthrown. And that is the reason why there was uh, so many uh, people opposing to it, um, uh, people rejecting what was new. Einstein, Schrödinger, Planck, all of them were opposed uh, to the success of quantum physics. Schrödinger said, if this damn quantum jumping doesn't stop, then I'm I regret having invented it at all. So, in uh, so uh, in its essence, uh, people were really focused on safety. They wanted safety. They wanted certainty. Of course, there were other people: Heising, uh, Heisenberg, uh, Weizsäcker, Weizsäck, uh, and Bell. Uh, and Bohr, they uh, were happy to have some uncertainty injected. We'll get, get back to that later. If you really want to understand what quantum theory is, uh, this is a book that you should uh, read. Uh, it was published in 1999 in Heidelberg. Uh, quantums are different, and uh, that is something which doesn't include too much mathematics and to understand what this is about. You need to see. If you really want to understand mathematics, uh, then quantum theory can be explained in a way that normal people can understand what this is about. Now, people keep uh, saying that quantum theory is something that you cannot possibly understand, and I think you couldn't be more mistaken. Quantum theory has much more to do with our everyday life than many physicists uh, will claim. If you want to briefly summarize what quantum uh, theory is about, then uh, the first thing is quantum theory can be understood as uh, the uh, physics of relationships. A relationship does uh, more than just keep things in uh, two different places. Um, you have separate objects and forces uh, acting between them in uh, the regular world, but quantum theory says that this is an approximation which often works, but uh, if you need more precision, uh, the old view is not good enough. And the second thing that uh, quantum theory teaches us is that not only facts have an effect, but possibilities can also have an action, can act and an effect. Quantum theory is uh, the physics of uh, the whole and a holistic approach to physics. That, uh, that uh, 
uh, the sum is more than its constituent parts. Um, well, most people um, in uh, physics still had uh, to take frogs apart. And if you uh, see a frog uh, in front of you dissected and in its part, then of course what you see is that there are relationships of uh, parts that no longer exist, and this is why the frog is dead. So as you put things apart, uh, if you take things apart, uh, you lose something essential, and that is the interesting thing. This is one uh, typical feature of quantum theory. Then, well, that theory demonstrates that this is a physics of possibilities. We know from our everyday life, um, from education, if something is very rigid, if possibilities are taken away from us, then our behavior will change. Then uh, dictatorships, of course, try to limit people, restrict people, and that will have an effect. Uh, not only facts, but also uh, possibilities that you can imagine have an effect. Uh, you may see different avenues in front of you, and that will have an effect. And uh, that, again, is something that you don't find in regular physics. As we discuss quantum theory, it is important to see that quantum uh, theory is much more than just quantum mechanics. If you talk about uh, physicists, they only talk about quantum uh, mechanics. In 1900, Planck came up with the quantum hypothesis. In uh, 1905, uh, Einstein postulated light quantums. In 1925, Heisenberg was the first one uh, to come up with uh, the mathematical structure of quantum mechanics. So it is with Heisenberg that quantum theory begins as a mathematically formulated theory. Heisenberg, in very, his very young uh, years, won uh, the Nobel Prize. With Heisenberg, it is uh, that quantum theory began. But he t took a form that was very cumbersome and not uh, uh, very friendly to deal with. A year on, uh, there was the Schrodinger equation uh, that uh, showed uh, the quantum world uh, uh, in terms of the Maxwell particles, and uh, many physicists were aware of that, and that was easier to work with. Since the 1930s, Heisenberg and Pauli uh, had uh, begun to think of quantums uh, not only with regard to, to electrons and protons. Quantum um, theory was limited to electrons, and they assumed that electrons uh, simply existed. What uh, is in quantum mechanics, uh, what quantum mechanics describe is how they relate to one another, but the quantum field theory that was the next step. The quantum theory was not limited uh, to matter, but also uh, to force fields. Force fields. Uh, there were fields uh, that were also treated by the means of quantum theory. In 1955, it was Carl Friedrich von Weizsäcker who was the first one who said that quantum theory should uh, or could have another foundation. You shouldn't only talk about the smallest parts. Now, the idea that people had had for 2,500 years that, that there was a small as possible uh, particulate, uh, the atom, as it were, uh, that uh, was then obsolete. He was the first one to propose a new theory, quantum information, he called it, and that was beyond what people could imagine at the time. But there were experimental works by Bennett, uh, Stephen Hawking, Zeilinger, who had been mentioned before, that uh, changed the world. So quantum information is uh, now a familiar notion in physics. And in 1990, I've been able to show that you connect uh, Weizsäcker with Stephen Hawking and use their calculations, then you can demonstrate that this idea uh, can be linked uh, to already existing physical principles. But this, uh, what I need to uh, emphasize is that quantum information is abstract. It is free of any importance and uh, that, or meaning, and that is a bit harder to grasp. I'll grant you that. But uh, before we get there, let us tell you more about quantum theory. One more comment. What's also important is that quantum theory restricts uh, objectivity. Yeah? And after all, objectivity is what uh, science, natural sciences are all about. In classical physics, the idea is you have an object that you want to study, investigate, and uh, then you can say, if I very carefully measure this object, um, I can find exactly what the state of this object is. Right? Quantum theory demonstrates uh, that, in principle, it is impossible, because of the quantum system, a quantum system uh, that you don't know, a 
quantum system of who, uh, which nobody ever tells me what it is like, I cannot really find out what it's like. I can measure it, of course, and I can know exactly what the system is like after the measurement, but I cannot measure what it was like before. Uh, so that is a certain limitation or a restriction of the ideal of objectivity, uh, which controlled or uh, dominated uh, traditional science. Uh, so you can only vaguely detect an unknown quantum object. If you postulate uh, that one and the same quantum object can be brought into one and the same state all over and over again, I don't know what it is, but I can get it into the same state over and over again, and I can measure any number of times. Well, but you can imagine how long that would take, or that it would be incredibly difficult. So an unknown quantum object can uh, not be detected. Uh, uh, you don't know what it, uh, what state it had before you measured it. And the same goes for somebody else's consciousness. You can uh, only vaguely know, roughly know, uh, what the state of somebody else's consciousness is. So quantum theory opens up new avenues of thinking, new possibilities, because it describes um, uh, holes uh, that extend over space and time. Yeah? And uh, well, that was first ex uh, demonstrated with the double slit. And that's really enough. Yeah, quantum objects they can be seen as uh, parts or particles or as waves, and this is a classical object. Uh, it is uh, like a picket fence with gaps, and if you throw um, stones through it, uh, then uh, they will go through a hole or they will not. Or on the right-hand side, you have a water wave with two openings, and uh, on the other side, there will be interferences that arise. You know that uh, because you've all thrown stones into the water, and then uh, you will see uh, these interference patterns, and that would be uh, the classical things that you'd observe. Now, let's uh, take the quantum perspective. You have a double slit, and uh, the possibility, say, is to send out electrons, but only a single electron at a time. So, if you cover up one of the slits, um, then, if I let this run for a longer time, then you'll have a cluster uh, at that point. And if you check, uh, you will have one click per electron, and uh, if you add up uh, the electrons, you'll get a cluster at the end. Uh, same as you throw stones through a fence, then you'll have a pile of stones uh, behind the fence, and that would be that. That's easy to understand. And as soon as you open the other slit, you will create another pile, another cluster behind that. That's not magic either, but now it gets harder. If you open up both slits and you control that, for instance, by adding here very smooth measurement devices, but that says, well, an electron with a charge passed through here, or you have a second one that said it now passed through here, you're actually checking both holes, both openings, but that's all you do. So there's always going to be one electron after the other arriving, and each time my recorder will do a click saying, well, this electron passed through that slit or that slit. So with a control system, you are going to see those two piles that overlap over there, just like if you throw stones or rocks. Now, if you eliminate control, what you're getting is more than just two piles, even though you only have two openings over here. And that's exactly what's the basic idea, so to speak, of quantum theory, what explains it. This point right here, this pile, these piles, if they get controlled, this point can be reached. But if there's no control over the two openings, it's not reached. And if you rephrase that, it means if the electron has the possibility, really has the possibility, not a possibility limited by control, if the electron really has the possibility to be able to go through two openings, its behavior changes. It's different from if there's no such possibility, which we know from our own lives. You know, if the possibilities, the options get restricted, we behave differently than if we have all different types of possibilities. Of course, we cannot certainly try them out all at the same time. We can only make one of the possibilities of the options real. But the sheer limitation of what's possible changes our behavior. And quantum theory shows this. If we actually work very precisely, very accurately, we can certainly see that this already applies to electrons or photons and other objects of nature. You can certainly read that in the books as well. 
The second thing that we need is the tunnel effect. Quantum systems, well, in principle, they are extended. So we have a hill here, we roll down a ball, there's a little hill again, and when the ball comes from the top, it cross it and then leaves. If we let go of that ball, it's going to be rolling back and forth within that sink. It's never going to be crossing that little hill. Classical physics says the law of energy categorically prohibits this ball from crossing that hill. It has a certain potential energy that turns into kinetic energy, then back into potential energy, but this ball can never ever get across that hill. This green ball getting out of that sink, out of that valley, well, the law of energy actually 100% prohibits that. And in biology, the law of energy is kind of a sacred cow. Everybody believes in that. But quantum theory says if we get more precise than that, it's not as simple as that anymore. If we have a quantum object in that area, we have a prohibited area here where the law of energy says that the ball cannot be there. Quantum systems, however, they're extended, they're stretched, which means that there's a certain probability where the potential location of that object could even be outside of here. And then what may happen is that this potential location becomes real, and then that part has left, which does not apply to just about any segment, but for short distances it's possible. So that quantum theory really goes to show for everyday life, for energy industries, and for everything that we meet in everyday life, the law of energy is something that we can certainly believe in. But if we go real precise and accurate, quantum theory shows that we have to be more careful than that. And now the EPR experiment. We heard about that before. So today there's experiments done by Zeilinger and his staff that are looking at quantum systems that extend like 100 kilometers. So this is important to see that. Let me show this chart for that. Just like Planck and Einstein, even Schrödinger was somebody who really was very unhappy about quantum theory. Even Bell, he was a person who actually invented his equation in order to finally have something in his hands to disprove quantum theory. And then Aspect made these experiments in 1972. And then in those days, they still believed that they could actually twist it in some way. And Bell, he gave a presentation in Munich, and Weizsäcker and myself, we actually talked to him over a beer, and then Bell was saying that he was cold-blooded, cold-blooded enough to accept that reality was different than we wanted to be, because he had hoped to be able to prove quantum theory wrong. But he was cold-blooded enough to accept that reality is not like he or Einstein or Schrödinger would want it to be. And of course, Schrödinger, he's somebody who couldn't like, who did not like quantum theory, so he introduces a term that makes it quite impossible to really understand what it's all about. Entanglement. That's certainly a term that's making it inconceivable to really understand what it's all about. And I mean, this goes back to carpentry. You entangle two boards by sawing teeth in them like that, and then you have big holes that you can put glue in, and then it lasts longer than if you just put it together blunt, in a blunt way. But I mean, two entangled boards are still boards, and that's what it's all about about in other theories, but not in quantum theory. It's not like two entangled particles are there. If you assume that, you don't understand anything. What you are using two particles for is you produce a quantum system of them, from them. And this quantum system is a whole. And this whole extends in space, but it's still one whole. And then, on one side, you can intervene and then take this whole apart into two parts. But as soon as you don't take it apart, you don't have two particles that are entangled, you just have one whole. And for every person, it's quite understandable. If you have like a large Chinese vase, which is complete, and you use a hammer on it, the whole vase is damaged. No surprise. So if you have a hole and you intervene in one spot, you change the whole. We extensively described that in our book on the creative cosmos, and it was actually published in Heidelberg in 2002, but it's not been translated into English, not yet, so apparently our scientists have failed to read it. 
to this point. But if you read it, you can certainly try and understand Creative Cosm Cosmos published in Heidelberg in 2002. It's our book in German. So that's what it's all about. Quantum systems, they are a whole. And if you actually do a measurement, you have effect on the one hand, but on the other hand, what you also have, if you follow Einstein, but Einstein failed to grasp it like that. On the other hand, you don't have a de facto state, you have a quantum state. So with that experiment, it's basically impossible to actually send a message from one side to the other. On the other side, you have no factum, you have a quantum state. And only if you do the very same measurement as on the one side, will this guy over here be able to exactly predict what's happening over here. But if over here you do something else, then this predictive power over here is gone. So you have to realize that. It's all related. The essentials for our worldview about quantum theory is that it eliminates differences, differences that seem insurmountable in normal life. The difference between particle and wave, we saw that before. In the quantum object, it's all dependent on the states, whether it's showing this property or that property or interim levels. Quantum theory also shows something else. Is something an object? Or is it a characteristic? Well, it all depends on the circumstances. It's not been fundamentally defined. Quantum theory, well, there's a difference between full and void. It puts that in perspective. It's become clear already in the morning. And quantum theory also shows something else. Medieval philosophy and physics found it important to differentiate between Force and substance, substance you can touch and feel, force you don't see it. This is also put in perspective by quantum theory. In the large accelerators, force is turned into substance and the other way around. Einstein's equation that he got famous for means in everyday language, matter can be turned into movement and movement can be turned into matter. And at Leipzig we still learned that Lenin was saying there's only matter and movement is its basic characteristic. Einstein is showing us that both things can be turned into one another. Characteristics can become objects. And the essential principle of our presentation is all about matter. Matter is equivalent to quantum information. A property stays in fairy tales, like this cat that was sitting on the tree in Alice in Wonderland, even if that object disappears, well, you can certainly begin to imagine that. But I mean, if we take a poem like Goethe, that describes the Gingo and his Maya set, you know, we can also consider the property of the paper, what's written on it, and we can send it, fax it all over the world these days, and the vehicle is different, but we still have the same information. Or you can also memorize this poem and then burn the paper, but the information is still there. It's simply changed vehicle. And I think, you know, this is really important when talking about all of this. And Dirac was talking about the so-called Dirac C, the vacuum. If we want to explain it to non-physicists with words, we would say the vacuum is the whole, like Heisenberg once said. And then you could imagine a C, a lake like that. And you throw a big stone in it, and then the stone picks up air bubbles into the water, and then you have water splashing on the surface. The splashes, that would, would be our normal matter. And the air bubbles in the water, uh, that would be our empty matter. And the whole lake, the whole sea, would be our vacuum. The quantum vacuum, so essentially it's the information at every point in space, there's no particle. It's infinitely much information, and if you rearrange it, you can use it to create as many particles or quantum fields as you like. And of course, that also matches experience made by people in meditation or Eastern philosophy, where this was perceived a long time ago. But here we have a mathematical basis. Of course, I will not try and explain it to you, but without the mathematical basic understanding, all of this would just be words. 
it's not all about me giving you beautiful words here, telling you lots of stories. It's all important for you to trust me when I say that in physics there's a hard mathematical basis for it. Without it, everything would just be empty words. So we just heard that. Deep in nature, the differences that we perceive disappear more and more. So we start wondering, what about it? What about this fundamental structure? What's the original structure, the original substance behind it? And now here we go. Karl Friedrich von Weizinger, well, since about 1955, he was thinking about that. The idea of the atoms. Well, basically, it's not here to stay. And he said, physics based on quantum information, that's how we should go, which was extreme in those days. It was an outsider's view. And it was very difficult for him and his friend, Werner Heisenberg. He who invented quantum theory, he's saying on this program of Weizsäcker, the implementation, the execution of this program, and, you know, try and think about that. The execution of this program requires thinking that has to be as abstract as unprecedented, at least in physics, which basically applies to this very day. I would want to say it applies to most physicists. They're so abstract that they feel like Heisenberg, who said about himself that to him, Heisenberg, it was much too difficult. You can certainly read it in the detail and the whole, but he's also saying that he, Weizsäcker, should at least be trying together with his staff, because Heisenberg, he felt the potential. He felt there was potential out there that he could not grasp for real, but he said you should try a thinking as abstract as unprecedented, at least in physics. So that's important to be even more abstract than Weizsäcker. Weizsäcker, he actually used information the way that we speak about information every day. Information is something that we can know, that they can know, and he says an absolute notion of information does not make sense. That's what he writes in Auf Bauer Physik. But mass has an absolute value. A mass of zero grams is nothing. That's absolute. But in temperature, it's different. You have the Celsius thermometer, and then you have zero degrees, and then you can continue downwards. As long as you can measure temperature in Celsius, you were basically not able to understand what temperature really is. Then we had the Kelvin scale with an absolute zero point, and then you could start understand what temperature is. Temperature is like the internal movement of the elementary structures within air, gas, liquids, or solids. And of course, then it's pretty obvious there can be not less movement than movement, so even less temperature than zero degrees, that's not possible. So, you know, less mass than zero grams cannot be, so you also need an absolute notion of information if it's your objective to look at matter and information and to make that equivalent. So it has to be quite obvious what the zero point is. So in case of information, you cannot just take sender and receiver abstract. You also have to make meaning abstract, making information so abstract that you cannot add importance or meaning that's quite difficult. Meaning is always very much all about subjectivity. You cannot actually move it into objective science. And you know, we removed one of our charts here, but we had two dogs here on the tree. You know, when we walked our dog when it was still alive and there was a puddle by the tree, I actually made sure I didn't step into it. But my dog kept putting his nose into it. The same information, there's a wet puddle by the tree in my dog and myself, two very different meanings. It's like the puddle does not have meaning in itself. The meaning is generated from perception and the processing within our information processing system. And of course, it's different in a dog or in myself. Meaning, meaning is something that you have to separate from information and then quantum information can become an absolute value. Stephen Hawking's entropy of black holes, it was useful to use it for that. And then basically you could start looking at Weizsäcker's philosophies and the real physical data. You could start combining that. But like we said, information actually is perceived to be meaningful by most of us. For the abstract information, we needed to choose a new 
term. And Schüssler proposed proposals for this, a structure that can become an information vehicle. And we need something like that, because with the old explanation regarding matter, that it consists of small parts of matter, or to rephrase that, matter is small matter, it's just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. That's something that most important philosophers already realize. That's not a real explanation. And even in physics, the dead end continues into the spatially small. And you have to try and really understand that. Most of us, I don't think, realize that. The idea is that you keep making it smaller, and that the original idea was then it's getting simpler all the time. So, you know, then you have the elementary particles, once you understand them, and that's many of my colleagues say that to this very day, then you actually understand. Quantum mechanics, that's really pretty, pretty simple for most of my colleagues. It's like an electron in a shell, and quantum mechanics is what you need in order to understand chemistry and biology as a natural scientist. And then we saw this before. We have the nucleus of the atom, which is much smaller than the shell. But the effect is like nuclear physics is not simpler. It's a lot more complicated than quantum mechanics. The nucleus, well, if you have large machines, you can take it apart. And then you have elementary particle physics, as we call it. And that's the most complicated theory that we have in physics. And I mean, you can really use it to calculate something. And it's a lot more difficult than nuclear physics. And if you want to get more complicated than that, you can go into even smaller structures and string theory. And of course, you know here that if you're on the lucky side, you have like 10 to the power of 100 theories, which is a lot more than the big numbers that we saw happening in the banks recently. So we don't even know whether this theory really exists and whether it really has something to do with physics, which does not degrade its value as a mathematical theory. It's a very important mathematical theory, but we don't know whether it's had anything to do whatsoever with physics. The smaller the objects, the more complicated the theory, not the simpler the theory. So this is a dead end street if you start believing that you need smaller structures all the time and then you're done, this actually is a dead end. Solution? Quantum information. A qubit, a quantum has no decision. You cannot divide it any further. That's logically evident. You know, deciding even more than a simple yes, no decision, not possible. But the qubit is not spatially small. The qubit is stretched. It extends through the whole cosmic space. An example which might explain it. If you have sinus, it divides this circular line into two halves. And then if you look at quantum theory, and you're not doing an additive combination, here you're doing a multiplicative combination. And if you take a sinus and you multiply it by 1,000 with itself, you get two sharply localized things. Quantum theory shows that, that this is possible. It's possible to take something very much localized and to make it from something that's very much extended. If you had just one bit, you could actually use it to split the whole cosmos into two halves. If you had much more decision-making power, you could take an atom or a an atomic nucleus for this. Quantum theory tells us the primary thing is the extended and the localized. That's something that's not natural. It's something that results from development. A lot of extension becomes something that's very narrow. And that's also something that is actually very hard for us to try and grasp. But this is something that you can learn from quantum theory. And this helps us get away from the mechanistic idea of the small spheres into a structure of abstract quantum information that, that is much more similar to what we know already. You know, our thoughts in an informational structure, a mental structure, that we consider the basic structure of reality.
The revolutionary concept, the new concept of matter means energy and matter, well, basically they're made of qubits. 10 to the power of 41 qubits, that's how you can actually describe a proton, the nucleus of hydrogen. When Weizsäcker said that for the first time in the 1970s, proton 10 to the power of 40 bits, well, that's when the physicists were just smiling and laughing about that. But, but with quantum information theory and the entropy of the black holes, it turns out today that you have very good physical reasons for showing it like that. So this equation E m equals E c square, that's something that you can actually add something to. Mass is also equivalent to a number of quantum bit ends, and the factor we attach is the blank effective quantum divided by the speed of light. And this is the age of the cosmos that happens. Then we have 6 pi. And this ratio, it also depends on the mass of the cosmos, because in the quantum bit, well, we primarily have a cosmic event here. And the extension of cosmos, as we say in physics, is a different expression for saying that the amount of quantum information in cosmos is just getting bigger all the time. And then there's three different aspects of this abstract quantum information protoposis. A very nice example, H2O. We know that H2O can be ice. I mean, if you ever had a snowball hit you as a child, you know what ice is. It could also be water, though, or steam. And you could also say protoposis, the abstract quantum information, appears as matter. Matter means it's formed. And what's important is matter provides resistance to change. So, like in cold weather, if you had to push your old chubby car, you knew it was harder than pushing a cart of a child. We have five kids, so I know what I'm talking about. In order to move matter, you need energy. Energy is exactly what is able to move matter, and then you start sweating. And information, information is what is able to trigger energies in your everyday life. Like if you hear something and you're inspired and you jump up, well then the energy that it takes to move your body out of your chair just doesn't come from information, it comes from your body. It's energy you have to have provided before. You have to have had breakfast or something. But then information could then trigger the energy that you stored. So information is the agents that can trigger energies. And energy is what can move matter. And matter is the vehicle that can provide resistance to any change. Protiposis, if we consider it the basic substance, then your normal photon, one that we can see, that's about 10 to the power of 30 qubits. Meaningful out of the 10 to the power of 30 qubits, well, maybe five or six bits out of the total. For instance, the frequency, the color of that photon, or the direction it's coming from. And, you know, some animals, they can also actually perceive the spin of a photon, the rotation of a photon. We need devices to get that. But that's the energy of the photon. What's meaningful, though, is only very little of it, just like the poem on that paper. Most of what you're holding is paper. And the poem itself, well, it's just a small, small part of the whole weight of that paper. The paper with the poem or without, if you weighed it, well, your standard scale wouldn't show you a difference because it's so little, such a tiny difference. Similar here, meaningful quantum information is just a tiny bit of the whole. What's also important is this, quantum theory, if it's a theory of the possibilities, and you know in the GDR before we were able to leave, I was a grave digger at some point, the 2.7 seven tons of Earth, once you had shoveled it in again, you thought it was a fact. I guess you would agree with me had you done that. So we, we cannot live just with possibilities. We also need to take facts seriously. We need part, one part of physics that's working with quantums, but that's not everything. We need a second part of physics that actually 
makes it possible for possibilities to create effects. We need a dynamic structure of layers, a combination of classical and quantum physics. And then physics, you know, with the help of mathematicians, we've learned to transfer these structures from one into the other. From classical physics, we go through a mathematical process, quantification, and then we come into quantum physics and back to the boundary cases. And this layer structure says, well, as long as it's possible, as long as we don't have to be real precise, we'll be using classical physics. But classical physics, uh, this might just be important. Just a second. Life, life is a process. A process going beyond these two parts, these two processes. If we want to try and understand life, we cannot try and do that without quantum physics and not without classical physics. We need both. And then there's another important element maybe on the quantum theory. Often quantum phenomena are discussed almost just like classical physics. Like if you throw a big stone into a window, usually you break it because it's glass, made of glass. Cause and effect, that's what classical physics is working with. And in quantum theory, well, in principle, it's not possible. In principle, it's impossible to look at a quantum system and to create it in a desired state. And if you're pretending that you could do it, you're cheating your audience. What you can do, though, is you can specify a frame within which this quantum system is supposed to be. Simply put, you can specify whether the electron spin is supposed to be vertical or horizontal, like we saw before in those pictures. So you can specify that. The spin, should it be vertical or should it be horizontal? It's not possible to make the spin go up. But in quantum theory, what remains is like a Cinderella system. You're actually taking the cases you like, you use them, and you throw out the rest, which means all these phenomena that are based on quantum theory are not like where, in principle, we can now achieve this now. We can actually create conditions for making something possible. But whether it's really going to happen, that's not something we can decide. So that might just be important when discussing all these phenomena. Now, I think it is difficult uh, to take you in a gallop through the cosmic evolution and to, to life, but maybe it gives at least uh, an impression of uh, what we're interested in. Well, because we now have a ground substance, a basic substance, uh, which is based on quantum bits, where possibilities are uh, possible but not determinate, and uh, possibilities may be determined but not the facts, and I think that helps to understand uh, the diversity which has arisen in the cosmic evolution. It's a huge diversity which has created such wonderful uh, shapes and designs uh, that uh, we can all enjoy. We've seen this one before. This is the earliest uh, that uh, you can, the earliest picture, the baby picture of the universe. Now, as we move more closely, we can see galaxies, and we've seen them before, and as we uh, go even closer, we get uh, to uh, the area of our sun. Uh, sunlight today is uh, the greatest source of almost all life. There are some life forms which do not uh, depend on sunlight, but uh, those are very few. Then uh, Earth and Moon, the essential point is that uh, life is uh, made possible by photosynthesis, and that is due to the sunlight. Now, as we talk about the evolution of life, as we go from uh, the bottom to the top, what we find there is a symbiogenesis in the beginning. So there's no strict separation of uh, species, but a genetic uh, transfer, a gene transfer, which is horizontal, until there is the situation where new forms, uh, many celled uh, life forms can develop here. 
at some point in time, we arrive at species, oh, however difficult that is to define. Then there is selection, there is adaptation to the situation, but there are also genetic mutations. So that is where quantum effects become visible macroscopically in the genes. And changes would not be possible if we had a strictly and rigorously deterministic cosmos. And this is the action of the dynamic layers, which also manifest in the evolution of what is alive, what is biolo biological. And in the post-Darwinian evolution in our culture, we have a lot of information that is passed on by technical means, by language or in writing. And this is for the first time that we don't strictly depend on uh, biology to pass on information. It is life uh, that uh, makes information meaningful. And uh, these are systems which are not in a thermodynamic equilibrium. They're instable by nature, and internal quantum information processing can see to a certain degree of internal stabilization. It's important to realize here that there is something uh, like an optimum uh, between uh, rigidity and variability. Uh, stability or rigidity, well, that wouldn't allow for life. But instability, too much variability, uh, is not conducive uh, to uh, the long term, and uh, any arbitrariness wouldn't help either. So photons are carriers of events that take place in the living organisms. And Fritz Albert Popp has worked on this. All interactions in living beings are electromagnetic. The essential carriers information processing are virtual and real photons. Here, plants, as a good example, they emit real photons, and um, that uh, is something that nobody wanted to believe before for Fritz Walter Pop. That, all, however, requires a lot of experimental experience and good devices, but this shows quite clearly what healthy and to, uh, what stricken uh, leaves look like. Fritz Walter Pop has um, uh, embraced the findings on the rows of photons and has used great experimental accuracy to study real photons that control and accompany every living process in plants and animals. In the beginning, we had said uh, that this causes resistance. Schopenhauer put that very nicely. He said, in the beginning, uh, new findings are denied. Uh, people laugh about them. They are ridiculed. And after they've carried the day, that is, after they've been ignored, then everybody says, we've known that before. We've always known that. But in the meantime, there are massive fights. First, ridiculing, then a massive fighting against. And then everybody says, oh, I always knew it worked like that. And so this is what we keep seeing in these uh, sciences and scient uh, scientists all the time. It's my experience 20, 30 years ago where, when you talked about quantum theory, well, um, that was, uh, people were talking about exceptions. It had nothing to do with reality uh, that has changed. In the meantime, in popular science magazines, you will find all kinds of things on quantums. And a third of the gross uh, national product is uh, generated with the help of of quantum theory. Let me put it this way. Quantum theory has nothing to do with esotericism. A third of GNP uh, in industrialized states is based on the applications of quantum theory, lasers, uh, beamers, uh, even uh, mobile phones and computers. Um, all these things would be, in principle, impossible without quantum theory. Of course, the progress of knowledge cannot be stopped forever. That is from uh, 2011, where it's demonstrated that uh, coherence and entanglement uh, can also be found in the avian compass. Everybody used to say, biologists first of all, but many physicists too, knew that uh, living beings are far too warm uh, for quantum effects to be uh, important. When I said that 10, 15 years ago, everybody laughed at me. And that is the Schopenhauer laugh, mind you. Now uh, they find out uh, that uh, birds navigate because uh, they can 
10 times better than we can uh, do that, uh, that they can have coherent states um, with which they can measure the Earth magnetic field. So uh, nature will use all phenomena for life, all the phenomena that we have detected, all the quantum effect, uh, coherent states, tunnel effects, uh, the change of information um, from uh, properties to other uh, objects, and um, th there's of course much more that we don't even know about these days, but nature uses that already. Many people uh, may uh, not like to hear about chemistry or physics, you might be scared off, but I think it's become clear that there's an uh, evolution in uh, the cosmos, in what is biological and so on, and physics is really the starting point, and physics work everywhere, even uh, if new laws and rules are added, and it can also explain why something completely new can come about, that is chemistry for you. Sometimes you don't uh, think about uh, oxygen and hydrogen, that there are two gases that are completely different in their properties, and yet when they come together, they form water. There is something that we've internalized, but we uh, can marvel again and again at the degree of creativity uh, in this cosmos, simply because there's the action of the quantum and the quantum information. There's also self-stabilization of what's unstable. Well, that's life, and that is uh, possible, and that's just in a marvel as uh, the fact that that the mental space grows wider and wider in the course of biological evolution. It begins with a feeling and uh, then uh, goes over into experience. It goes into the unconscious, which always has uh, to do with effects and emotions, and uh, they will uh, then, of course, have an effect also on the mind. So this is for the first time to have a, a scientific concept of consciousness, which is based on natural sciences, and to, to explain the unit of mind and matter in a natural science way. There's a famous doctor, a, a, a physician, a physiologist, uh, Emile de Barremont, and uh, he gave a famous speech in 1872 in Leipzig when uh, uh, the natural researchers and physicians had come together. And his conclusion was, if um, uh, the uh, being of force and uh, matter was something that we understood, then we could uh, finally understand how living beings feel and think. And well, that was 140 years ago, and I think today uh, we can uh, now begin to say these things. Consciousness is quantum information that experiences and knows itself. In the course of evolution, more things get added uh, that uh, drives us from the inside. Children in all uh, cultures are curious, have interest. They can show surprise, but also disgust. Later on, they feel joy. Um, they can be upset, they can be sad, they can have fear, and there are other emotions that come into it. And then uh, guilt and shame will also have to develop, and that usually takes place from the second uh, year of life onward. And uh, that uh, usually has an influence and grows into uh, our moral concepts. I think it's important to know uh, that uh, the the way that we deal with effects and uh, emotions are important, but we need to find the right words for them uh, so that uh, we can uh, see them as objects and remember them properly. Well, consciousness costs a lot of energy, and that means that many things must happen unconsciously. Roughly 2% of our body mass and 20% of our energy consumption are used uh, for the brain, and uh, things get uh, easier if we do it automatically, and usually we only feel our body if it uh, is painful out of a sudden, if it hurts, or if there's some outside information coming, and then we might uh, realize that we been acting uh, pre-consciously or unconsciously, and uh, as if an automaton and in uh, therapy, it's important to see what's unconscious in ourselves and uh, which acts like a force that you don't see, uh, because there are things from the unconscious that uh, have an effect uh, that make us act, and sometimes in a way that you don't like if you start thinking about it.
because uh, they uh, can continue to act in the unconscious. I think um, this is how we can imagine, and it's simplified, uh, of course, we can imagine how uh, we can develop. Let's say um, we have um, quantum information incarnate, and uh, there's, of course, influences from the outside world, and uh, then we can go on uh, to include uh, more and more representations and experience them. Most of them um, will remain unconscious, but as we experience, there will be uh, representations of those pieces of information into the consciousness. And once we've developed enough, and if we're healthy, then we can reflect on our consciousness, because uh, reflection on uh, information makes uh, it possible to visualize things. Then we can see why we can have several states in the consciousness, how we can compare them, and then we can reflect and think about them again. Of course, we can say uh, that uh, uh, the consciousness also uh, feeds back uh, into our experience and our body. And this shows why uh, some medication works, which could not possibly work. Let's just take the placebo, because uh, in my mind, I can imagine uh, that uh, it will heal and I can feel the healing force and that will have an effect, will act on my experience and that in turn uh, will have some physical manifestation. Well, we can influence everything. Some therapies begin at the experience level, others begin with a change in thinking and others begin at the physical level, at physical changes. And uh, in the final analysis, we're a unit uh, that always uh, acts on itself and uh, with one another and uh, environmental influences uh, also come into it because we respond to them. It is information uh, that is changed and shaped by our experience, by what we've learned, by uh, what we've inherited. And uh, that, in turn, can then be changed. There's not only the bottom-up effect uh, that uh, brain physiologists have postulated. It's not uh, just uh, the brain cells that uh, will act one way or another. No, there's also the consciousness which has an effect. Now we can start defining the consciousness, can't we? And, it, uh, and of course, consciousness needs as its carrier a healthy brain. We know, of course, what effects strokes and similar uh, hemorrhages can have. But um, starting with the consciousness, there can be the bottom-up effect. There can be self-healing. And uh, there can be changes, as it were, that uh, begin with the consciousness and uh, with the experience that we have, and all of that can influence the body. I think um, for psychosomatics, uh, this is an important input factor. Um, the idea is that these partial processes are all in themselves instable. In every second of our life, cells will perish while new cells are formed, not only individual ones, but millions of cells. There is um, a reconstruction, rework of all our cellular organism at all times, so there's instability built into it. And um, also, at every, in every second, uh, there will be many either-or decisions, which we are not aware of often because they're not in our reflective minds, but uh, these are things that are often influenced nevertheless by our minds. Um, this instability where information uh, can make a difference, uh, which of course then can trigger energies, and uh, these energies will uh, then in turn uh, be able to tense muscles or relax them. So uh, this interaction, I think, is something that uh, we can visualize much better. Bifurcation is the word that you've just read. Bifurcation is an instable um, equilibrium. And it is usually that people say this is where coincidence comes into it. But what we see in uh, living being is that when a decision is to be made, uh, 
uh, where um, there's no way around it, at that point in time, quantum theory must come in. It is important to see uh, that uh, it's not only coincidence that uh, comes to bear, it's also quantum information that can make a difference, and uh, that uh, is uh, regardless of the size of the living being. In living beings, we will see the situation over and over again that quantum information can influence something on the macroscopic level, but only where things are unstable, where something is stable, well, information will not make a difference. This is where you'd need energy. Uh, but if there is a decision to uh, be made at a bifurcation point, then quantum information can act and make a difference. Of course, that information will have to be passed on from the sensory organs, from our body, from our memory. And uh, that's when the first uh, coding comes uh, into it, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, coding takes first place in the eye, then the nerve cells uh, are the next point of contact, then there are further coding levels uh, where processing takes place, as in the visual or auditory center. And uh, after that, uh, decoding can take place in the consciousness um, by using the information that has already been uh, saved in our memory. There are things that uh, where language can come in, we can use our value system to assess the information. Much of that will still be at the unconscious level. And um, all uh, things that come from different centers um, uh, can then uh, be made into a one whole, uh, because uh, this is what is typical of quantum information. It uh, is driven towards uh, wholeness, and uh, that is the point here. Uh, so we can uh, see things that that uh, are part of one whole as parts of it. So carriers of uh, the mental, of uh, the pre and subconscious and the conscious, you may wonder what that is. Oh, it's no surprise there is photons, but there are also uh, molecular memories and uh, synaptic structures where information can be stored. So there are various levels at which uh, that is possible. So transfer of information happens with the virtual and real photons. There's a nerve cell, and usually uh, you know um, uh, how that works, but uh, the forces that uh, change things are real photons. And we know that what the definition of brain death is, well, that is um, that um, there are no real photons on the outside of uh, the skin of the head, no photons emitted anymore. And so uh, that usually ends uh, the life of a person and uh, the personality. Uh, seeing is a quantum process, and we've known that for a while. The photon are absorbed in the retinal cell, and uh, then uh, the biologists and uh, medical experts have understood now that there are quantum processes inside, because we can look into the eye now. We can see uh, where the photon enters the eye. Uh, that point is recoded, and then the virtual photon um, it uh, arises, uh, the real one becomes uh, many virtual photons, which then go on into other areas of the brain and are processed there. In the retina, a processing takes place, and this is uh, really new, May 2011. In, um, there are chemical signals in the vicinity so that uh, neighboring cells are activated, and then there are electrical signals, photons, um, demobilize uh, other cells. So that happens in the retina even, and uh, in the human and animal eye, um, we have um, excellent uh, contrast uh, perception, and they are still much better than the electronic cameras, and that is because of the quantum processes that we are able to invest investigate these days. Many people would have denied that they existed at all a while ago. So the type of photon matters, the color. Um, then there is a point of origin. If somebody comes from a certain point, uh, then I'll assume that light was emitted from there, and uh, usually a different point in the retina uh, would be different. But the destination in the brain would also make a difference. The virtual photons uh, that go to different places, or well, some of them um, uh, will um, do uh, uh, edges, others will do color perception, and then it goes to the front part of the brain, and uh, then um, images of people, houses, or buildings arise. And uh, they will also go on to, into the amygdala, uh, which um, are working on 
uh, emotions, and uh, then an emotional layer is added to that. There's nothing that we do not see that uh, does not pass these uh, emotional centers. Thank you. What do we often forget as we see these nice images from brain research is that all these investigative uh, methods are based on quantum phenomena. These are all applications of quantum processes, and as a physicist, I find it amusing, amusing that uh, um, people know that, of course, quantum physics has nothing to do with the brain at all. Now, EEG, in contrast with these devices, you have uh, to infer something from the outside. Yeah, But the EEG looks at real photons that are produced by the brain itself, and uh, the perception or measurement is outside uh, the uh, skull, and uh, then you can see exactly which brain center is active. Brain researchers keep asking certain questions. Yeah, For instance, uh, Singer asks, how can it be uh, that high speed of uh, conscious uh, process uh, because the uh, nerve uh, lines are, uh, are usually not, not that fast. And the answer is usually quantum theory. In a quantum computer, uh, you can understand uh, how uh, it, it, that is really many parallel computers. That's what a quantum uh, computer is like. Uh, with a classical computer, you have to um, look for the needle in the haystack and uh, examine every single uh, hay um, stock. But a quantum computer can look at all things at the same time. And where light is reflected, well, that uh, must be the metallic needle and can't be a haystack. So a quantum computer will give you uh, a probable statement very quickly, but it's still easier to find out whether that's statement is correct, then working uh, through all haystacks one by one. That makes uh, things so interesting for cryptography and secret services. But that is also the reason why our brains work so much better uh, than the classical computers that we can buy from Aldi or Lidl or other discounters, which have a much higher uh, attack rate, um, uh, but they can't uh, use as fast as our brains. And I think you uh, realize that when you see something. If you see something, I'm not quite sure, uh, you have assumptions, and then you check again and again, and then you know, oh, yeah, that it is. That, that must be it. And uh, the so-called uh, solution of the binding problem, that is something uh, that brain researchers get asked over and over again. How can it be um, that several sensory organs, the body, the memory, contribute uh, information, and we uh, sing only have a, a single result, a single, uh, after all, objects must be from different places, and uh, things are processed at different speeds, and still we get a picture very quickly. Uh, once we have uh, consciousness defined as quantum information, then we know that consciousness will look for gestalts, and uh, they will check uh, against that, and that will be top-down control, and that is a much easier way of processing information. So um, consciousness is not localized at all. Uh, we've uh, got used um, uh, to the idea of extended states, and I think that's important to remember. Uh, quantum information uh, can permeate one another. That is something that we're not really aware of. We don't perceive it even. It's our bodies, and our bodies um, yeah, are permeated by TV rays, say, by mobile phone rays, all of all these rays, all that information passes through us. And it's the same with quantum information. Quantum information does not need to be localized in a single place. It can be extended. Uh, and uh, that is um, why it uh, can be in several states at the same time. Um, in our development, it's important for us to go through several stages. We must reach a level of abstraction, uh, which you know as uh, the mirror experiment, where the animal or um, human being must be able to recognize uh, him or herself in a mirror. Uh, children can do that at 18 months of age, and we try uh, to see about animals. Can they re recognize themselves? It is um, very difficult uh, to make mirrors big enough 
for uh, elephants, say, so that uh, the mirrors don't uh, break as uh, the animals examine the mirror. So just imagine an elephant kicking the mirror, and uh, there you go. But it's been tested with harmonized with the macacus, with dolphins, uh, ravens, and elephants, and they have an ego awareness. They can detect and recognize themselves. And with people, as I said, they need to reach a certain stage of development before they can recognize themselves. They have to be 18 months of age. Now, before we come uh, to our last part, let me talk about uh, the sources of meaning. Of course, uh, there's a biological evolution that has uh, already given us a lot of genetic information. All our forebears, our ancestors have uh, passed on something. There has been genetic information, genetic stage. The state of hunger, for example, that information is also uh, stored in the genes that's been discovered recently. And what's important for everybody, um, there's the cultural information, the information that you acquire through culture. The culture around us uh, will determine our perspective on uh, notions, on terms, that will influence our behavior. In Asia, people might not express their feelings uh, that strongly after they've grown up in their own culture. Then, of course, uh, there are the reference people, uh, the reference persons. Um, and, uh, well, they will give us information, even as uh, infants, um, they give meaning uh, to the states that we have, or I want to be comforted uh, as a baby. These are things that uh, people will have to learn, and uh, they get through their, uh, the people that uh, they are associated with. Then there's the epigenetic uh, element, uh, the cells of the body, the organs play a role, but then there's the environment as well. All of uh, that leaves uh, its mark. And then there's the information uh, that our own experience um, gives us. In the implicit memory, for example, the relationships uh, of early childhood are stored, the way that people dealt with one another. That uh, is what you'll find in the implicit memory, even if the brain is not really that well developed, the hippocampus, for example, or the frontal lobe. Um, even if these um, uh, brain elements are not really fully developed, our physical experience will uh, still remain in our memory. And then there's, of course, uh, the meaning that we give to things and objects. Um, that uh, will also be influenced. That's our own state, our own physical state, our own mental state. Um, uh, that will also have an effect. Uh, if I'm in a depressive mode, uh, I will have a negative perspective on everything. If I'm more euphoric and in a good mood, um, then certain pieces of information will not really impress me, uh, even if it's not good. So incoming information is diverse, and it is uh, marked by um, uh, the many meanings that we may ascribe to it. Okay. In recent years, this has been in uh, the media a lot. Freedom of will, scientists have claimed, is an illusion, and we don't really have a free will. My mind uh, cannot determine anything. Now, uh, as long as we assume that uh, there are only cells in our brain, uh, that uh, information does not make a difference in the consciousness, well, in that case, that might be true, then we'd be determined, uh, that we'd that'd be determinism, and there wouldn't be freedom. Of course, it's not like we had uh, all the freedom in the world. There are many things that we cannot do or many things that we will not do. Um, there are also things that influence us. Ta let's take love. Will I, do I want to risk my love uh, by doing this or that? Or there are other restrictions that uh, limit or restrict our degree of freedom. Some possibilities are just not to be had. But the question is, uh, can the free will do anything at all? And I think it does now, because with quantum theory, we have this possibility to imagine uh, that uh, there are several possibilities, and uh, then in that framework, uh, we can decide freely as to what we want to do. Big headline in Süddeutsche Zeitung, the freedom of the fruit fly, and if you read the original, then the author is thinking about quantum theory. Could it be the cause for the fact that fruit flies show something that you cannot interpret any differently than 
that they're freely deciding about the situation because it becomes clear that the behavior of the individual flies is probably subject to probabilities. But in the framework of these probabilities, even these tiny flies can decide freely. I think we've now heard a lot about all these things that matter. It's our own experience, it's our own culture, the story of our life that matters. And this also applies to not just us ourselves, but also bigger groups. We have different things like verbal communication. We all know that. It's also something like nonverbal communication that we have on top of that, like bodily gestures that you show or that you with do not show, and underneath the level of consciousness, you observe something else, you perceive something else, the subliminal, that's not even obvious to us. It stops at the subconscious level, but it can still influence us. So we have many different forms of communication, and that's how we enter into a relationship with others, and that's also shown in the atmosphere. Is it tense? Is everybody having a good time? And it's also something that we cannot actually describe in detail, like what exactly is the atmosphere all about within this space that I'm occupying now? We cannot always describe it quite clearly. So there's something that we could also consider entangled or coherent states of quantum information that happens between people, or as Jung and Pauli call it, that happen between psyche and physics, the mind and the body. So when we have quantum information in ourselves, something else, something that we have in common, another element that's not effective from here to there, but it's something like a third object in space, which can also have an effect. And it's then possible maybe for us to imagine that even people that have an experience like that that something happens on them, that they're experiencing something, something that you actually cannot explain as chance. And that's not usually written about in the papers because it's usually embarrassing to talk about that, to report your experience. And I mean, today we can explain this better. Also with contemporary natural science, it's not considered a miracle or a riddle or a lie or imagination in people that have really experienced it and where in reality it was double-checked. And we realize that there is something that can now really be better explained by quantum theory. It could be a tunnel effect, it could be coherent states that might have taken effect that made me perceive something that, that could only be explained outside of natural sciences before. Right, then, going back to the triad of light, life, and consciousness. Here we can see the photons of light. They're at the beginning of everything that we can see and perceive, cosmic development and other developments. They are the very basis of the life processes, not just, not just based on photosynthesis, the sun, but also when it comes to the processes inside the living beings. And the photons in the brain, they are the essential vehicles of consciousness. And when they're gone, we're considered brain death. And protoposis, that's the very basic substance that allows us to try and understand all this in a natural science way. Which means, you know, this idea that the abstract quantum information can form to be matter, can shape and form itself, can express itself in energy. And finally, it can also become meaningful. Like a, a basic mental structure, so to speak, a substance from which all aspects have developed by evolution, a tremendous potential of possibilities, which is not random. And I think it's always important to say that possibilities follow laws when they develop. But what happens at the end as a fact is not predetermined in a deterministic way. And that's basically also our experience. And this is also something that's corroborated by nature. 
which provides the basis for the development. And I think that's very nice. And of course, we could continue speaking about this for a long time, like what this also means for us and how all of the new creations develop in Cosmos and how we also have responsibility because we have a free willingness and how will we continue to develop this and how we have to handle it in a responsible way. Right, and if you thought our presentation was too short, you can read about this in our books. Thank you for your kind attention.